Good morning, and welcome to Kingdom Ministry International. We have another exciting word today from the Word of God. We're excited about it. We're going to get right into it. It's going to be an awesome, awesome message, teaching from the Word of God. Today, we're going to continue on in our series entitled Cultivating Captivity. Cultivating Captivity. This is part two of Cultivating Captivity. If you haven't seen or watched part one, please do so. It is an awesome, awesome teaching, and it will give you an opportunity to be able to see where we're at. I don't want you just jumping in and missing things. So make sure if you haven't seen part one, go back and watch part one of Cultivating Captivity. We're talking about that. It's awesome. Let's pray. Let's get right into it. We don't want to spend a lot of time today. Get your pen, pad, notebook, notepaper, whatever you utilize to take notes, please do so. And once again, if we have any technical difficulties, just log off, log back on. It does happen. Unfortunately, the feed does get interrupted or the other things that happen. It's all technology that don't put no trust or confidence in this stuff. All right? Father, we do honor you. And we ask you in the name of your son to give us wisdom and understanding and clarity in your truth and your truth alone. For it is written, thy word is true. Help us to see into the unseen like never before. Examine our hearts, make sure we're in the faith. Father, allow us to apply clearly and accurately your truth, your laws, your precepts, and your concepts that we may be found worthy to enter into your resurrection. In the name of your Holy Son, we pray. So be it. All right, so we're going to get right into it today, and I want to uh, touch on something really quick today. I don't normally do this, but again, like I said, we're making changes. We're going to be incorporating different things. Uh, there's a book that um, I was recommended to read, and, and it's a really good book. Um, it's by Bruce Flurry, Bruce Flurry, and I'm trying to show you the front of it. It's called The Negro Project, The Negro Project. It's by Bruce Flurry. And it's him, and he's writing about Mar Margaret Sanger. Now, you know about Margaret Sanger, and we talked about changing definitions. I want to read a couple of usurps from the book real quick as we get started, and we're going to get right into the word. And the reason why is because in chapter one, he begins to talk about it. Again, it's Bruce, Bruce Flurry. It's called the Negro Project. That was the name of Planned Parenthood before they changed the name to Planned Parenthood. It was called the Negro Project. And it, it just doesn't include just blacks. It includes people of color, but mainly blacks. And one of the things in the book on page one of chapter one, it says, we should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engineering personalities. I'm sorry, engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea. It, if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. So she's recommending what, who to put up there, what kind of person to put up there, and exactly what the reason that they're putting them up there, not only to, uh, I guess, to advance their idea, but also to control the masses or populace in the church or even in the community by making it seem that way. I'm not going to read much more again. I'm not here to read the whole book. But I want you to see they did a study and they showed what happens after the murder takes place. They call it abortion after the murder takes place because they've already proven that once there's life in the womb, it's murder when you kill it. And they did a study and they said that 44% of the women complained of nervous disorders. This is in the book by Bruce Flory of what his findings are from talking to uh, the researchers that did it and also providers and doctors who perform abortions. Then they talked to the people and they found that 44% of the women complained of nervous disorders, 36% experienced sleep dis disturbances, 31% had regrets about their decision, and 11% required treatment with psychotropic drugs. Now that's on page 168. So I went from page 1 to 168, and there's a ton of stuff in there, eugenics and other things that go on, and they talk about the percentage of billions of dollars that uh, the government actually gave even up until 2016 for the abortion clinics and stuff. Why am I saying that? Because when you start dealing with the Word of God and you start dealing with things and understanding how it works, you have to understand that strategically everything that happens in the earth just doesn't happen. 
that God is in control of everything. And that includes Satan himself, that includes uh, the Antichrist, which is his children, and, and all those people who are doing evil. God allows certain things to happen at certain times in certain areas because it's prophetic. It's already been prophesied that this would happen as you break God's laws and as you continue to break his laws and do things. So I just want you to know that there are books and literatures that are out there that you can go purchase and, and grab that match what the Bible has already said was going to happen. So the plan of eradicating or increasing the abortion rate or murdering babies is astronomical and it's been planned since the fall and it's been, you know, we saw with Moses, you remember? They did it with Moses when they, the babies were born, they killed them. They did it also when Christ was on the earth and he was born. And there are other times when they're sacrificing their children to Moloch and other gods. So all this is going on and then suddenly there comes ideas of how to eliminate them from the core by putting certain uh, things in communities and doing damage. And the one thing that I've, I've always said and I continue to say, the Word of God, the Bible, I call it the manual, is very simple concerning how and what a lot of our problems are. It's because we continue to disobey God's laws and we continue to hate and despise each other. I know that a lot of the people have a role in it and I got it. But we're also doing damage to each other beyond repair in a lot of areas because we don't understand not only who we are, we don't understand the seriousness of what, who God says we are as far as what he requires of us because we're too busy hating, killing, doing things to each other and we're basically enforcing the plan of eradication upon ourselves without even them needing to help. So we have to interrupt that process and the only way to do it is the laws of God, commonwealth, the love of God, which is to obey God's laws, and then to love each other the way we're supposed to through civil, moral acts and behaviors. But again, that's another story. But that's the truth. That's the only way it's going to happen because most of the time we can point the finger at everybody else. They even had a project not too long ago where they actually went into different communities. I don't know if you remember uh, a few years ago they used to have what they call adopt the street, where they would actually adopt the street and they would take responsibility to clean the street, paint the houses, do all that stuff just suddenly stopped. But it's still out there, but people aren't doing it. So all I can say is this. Get the literature, see what's going on so you can understand. Teach your children the laws again. Begin to enforce those in your own life and in your children's life so that you can understand what's really going on because then you can see clearer. Because unless you do that, you're going to continue to see through the Word of God calls it fog lenses or a shadow of things to come. And we are supposed to be able to see and hear clearly as we obey God's laws. Doesn't mean we're going to see perfect in everything, but we'll be able to make right and conscious decisions according to the Word of God. All right? So let's get into this, the Word. Just wanted to encourage you today and also that let you know that there are a lot of things. We talked about part one of them, renaming stuff. And when you are seeing certain things renamed, it doesn't change a thing with the Father. It's still going to happen the way He wants. So understand this. When you pray to the Father, in the name of our King, the Christ, when you are seeing things happen demonically in the world and in society. And I said this before, let me say this so you can get it. Satan is a spirit. He is not a red, walking around with a red tail and pitchfork and red, that is not him, he is a spirit. He also is ideas and thoughts. That's why he comes to your thoughts. He tries to make suggestions because he is a spirit, okay? So when you understand that, you begin to change some of the things about how you see and perceive him as being someone red with a pitchfork with horns. No, that is Greek mythology, that is also paganism, and that's also things that they made up as an image of him and what it looks like to cause fear and to intimidate people to submit to him. Satan can only do what God allows him to do according to the laws and according to what God backs off of. That's why he is called, what, the accuser of the brother. Remember, these are legal terms. You have the judge of all the earth, which is the father. You have the prosecutor. And then from the prosecutor, you have the defendant. So the defendant is the Christ. The prosecutor is Satan. But also, the, process, the defender is the law, because Christ is the law. Remember, Christ is the law in flesh. He's the word of God. But the law also has in it punishment. So when you disobey, it gives a legal right for the law to attach a penalty. That's when Satan runs in. He comes in to make it worse. Why? Because he's the accuser of who? The brethren. Watch this. Not, not the people of the world. Not the unrighteous. 
He doesn't care what they're doing. If they're already doing what he wants, he doesn't need them. He doesn't, he's already got them. He doesn't need their help. He's, they're, they're helping him. So it's important that we understand that. So we're going to talk about cultivating captivity. So in other words, everything that happened in your life, stop the devil, the devil, the devil. No, yeah, look at the laws first. And then when you talk about the devil, are you understanding the difference between Satan, what he is allowed to do, and what you say he's doing? There's a difference. And I said it before, and I have to show it. He didn't, he didn't fall from heaven like we thought. You know, they taught us all that. That's not what happened. If you read the Bible, you'll see. When it talks about falling the way they try to describe it to you, it's like he was in heaven, he was kicked out, and he can't go back. No, Job said he was right there. He's talking to the Messiah in Luke. He also comes before the courts of God to blame us. So it's not that he was kicked out that way. It's something different. I'll talk about it soon. But understand this. It's not what they told us. That's why we have to learn the Bible. We have to acknowledge sometimes we don't know the Bible in certain ways. So stop saying, if you've been saying it, please stop saying that he was kicked out of heaven because of what he did. That's not what he said. What he talks about in Isaiah is talking about the authority position of his children when it says how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Lucifer is another name for his children. All right, that's what they call Lucifer. And so, it, again, I want to explain it to you simple so you can get it. So when you go back and read it, he's talking about his children's position of authority as far as their reign and a temporary reign on the earth. That's who runs the earth. His children, those are the ones who are in authority right now. This is a dispensation of the Holy Spirit, but it is the age of Satan. It is his children. That's who run it. The Edomites did. Uh, you have all these different ites, all right? They're the ones who run the entire world system, which affect the earth. That's what's going on right now. But that's what Christ is going to come and remove, okay? So let's let's get going here because we got a good, this is going to help you so much because it's going to change everything of how you think because the kingdom is already here. I also showed you that there were two kingdoms on the earth at one time when Christ talked about, if you see me cast out fingers by the finger of God, cast out demons, I'm sorry, by the finger of God to the religious leaders, then surely the kingdom of heaven has arrived, right? So he's not saying it's just coming, it's arrived. Him coming back to announce Everybody else is obliterated and it's just him being the king again. That's what he's after because that's how it started in the garden. The garden is the presence of the Father on the earth, but it's also the kingdom. It's the full manifestation. So we're going to talk about that today. So let's go to Exodus 13. I want to show you this and I'm going to give you a couple of scriptural references to write down. I'm not going to everything today because I can't do everything. Again, this is a series, so you'll get it. Just keep showing up. Tell your family to come on. Post, post, post. Keep posting the videos. I know people, well, I don't really agree with what you're saying and stuff. That's why I tell you to take notes. We stay in the manual. And that way you can go back and study it. Because the writer says study to show yourself approved. So go back, study it, research it, check it out, okay? Exodus 13. I'm reading out the New King James Version. We're going to start in verse 2. Because I want you to see what happens and what's going on with us. So you'll get it. And then when you get it, you'll have it. And when you have it, you're like, man, that's what's been happening to me as I'm cultivating captivity and how to be able to uh, be aware of things that are going on and make sure that you're not doing things that you shouldn't be doing or uh, basically having a check in your heart and your spirit so that you won't just be participating in things you shouldn't. In other words, don't practice breaking God's laws. Again, we're all going to make mistakes. Don't get all over the top with a religious jump. But it's the difference between making a mistake and practicing sin, okay? Exodus 13, we we'll start in verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, this is after the children of Israel came out of bondage. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of men and beasts, it is mine. So he's telling him now, this is a law. And he's saying, every man or beast, the first one that comes out of the womb, that word literally in the Hebrew is the word matrix. It's the word matrix. We're going to get into that very soon. Because when you understand what he's saying here, and your cross-reference to ensure this, I'm going to go to this one, but the next, any cross, any reference I give you after that, if I do, you're going to have to check him out. Now, if you go to, stay there, go to the book of Luke, chapter 2, because I want you to see this. So you understand what he's saying, because he's not saying every one that comes out. He's only talking about the males. He's only talking about the males. And Luke chapter 2, I think it's verse 23. Verse 23, this is the Christ, this is the Messiah. It says, as it, as it is written, Luke 2, 23, 
says, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So what he's referencing, Luke is referencing Exodus 13, 2. And he's identifying that every firstborn male that breaks the matrix, what is the matrix? Simple. It's the mold in which something is cast or shaped. The mold in which something is cast or shaped. So he's saying in that womb, while the child is in the womb, they're being molded and they're being shaped into what they're supposed to be in the earth. And he said every first male, that's why there's a different blessing, there's a different release for the first male than it is for the second male. Doesn't mean that anything is bad or whatever, it's just different. So Christ is the first one womb from Mary's womb, and here Moses is saying the same thing that Luke is confirming, that God still, this law still works. So for you who have sons, who were your firstborn sons, and you didn't dedicate them to the Lord, just go back and dedicate them now. That's what you're supposed to do, your firstborn son. It says the firstborn son that comes from the matrix, comes from the womb, you should dedicate. It is a law. It is not a request. It is a law from God. Your firstborn male child is supposed to be dedicated to God. That is God's child. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? See, when you, un when you start understanding and applying certain things, you understand why God wanted because later on you'll see it says Christ was, you know, firstborn. Then he was the firstborn from the dead. Then later on, by the Spirit, the writer wrote, it says, now, beloved, we are the sons of God. You see? So he's, even though he's king, he's our, he's our leader, he's the Messiah, he's all these things, but in the resurrection, he's the firstborn. You see? Because the earth, he went into the earth, he came out, he's the firstborn. His assignment, I said it over and over, you'll get it. He's the word, he came in as Emmanuel, and he was resurrected as Christ. Got it? So you're going you're gonna to get that today because this is where we're headed. Because when you understand this, then you understand what's going on with captivity and our punishment because our dis of our ancestors disobeying God's laws. Deuteronomy 28, you can read the whole chapter if you want. And it says, and no man shall redeem you, which means it doesn't matter where you look or how you want to say it. Nobody is going to redeem Israel from its current captivity or any captivity. It was always God. When the, in Exodus, who brought them out? God. You remember the Exodus? Doing, that was under the Egyptian. Under the Babylonian, who brought them out? God. Under the Persians? God. Under the Medes? God. Come on. Under the Romans? God. Under the Greeks? God. Now throughout the world, who's going to bring them out? God. This is the seventh captivity. This is it. This is it. There'll be no more captivity. Glory to your name. There'll be no more captivity after this. This is it. This is the seventh one. And this is, it's, it's been seven days. This is the seventh day. This is it. So, you must understand, this is what, this is a law. So, go back, for all you who didn't do it, and dedicate your son. Why? Because there's something that goes on and happens in us uh, that didn't, that was supposed to happen, but didn't happen because of the fall. And let's experiment, let's, let, let's see what's going on and why we experiment and do things the way we do and take chances in life. Let's go to Psalms 51. If you've been attending, it is written. You know we've read this. We're going to go back to it. So it is written. It's Tuesday nights, 7.30. Awesome time. It is written. It is written. It is our study that we study. So in Psalms 51, this is a prayer of repentance from our king at the time, the King David and everything. But I want you to see some things here. I don't want you to let familiarity get you. We're going to take our time on this one today. Because I want to give you some definitions and some things. Not as many as last week. Again, I told you that you're going to get more definitions on part one than any part. But I want you to see, and then we're going to move right into captivity about talk about some things in captivity. Then we're going to come out and we're going to leave you here today excited. And you're going to see something in that manual you may not have seen before. That's going to really, like, what? And then we also understand that even in this captivity as we come out, there is going to be a time of persecution and all these things. And it's going to happen because it's prophesied concerning uh, the children of Israel. You can't then say it's not going to happen, but the king is going to come and rescue us. All right? So let's go. Psalms 51. And this is David 
And he's saying to God, these are the things that happened to me and why I made the poor decisions that I made. Because you remember, this is about Bathsheba. This is about killing her husband, Uriah, for her. It's about having intercourse with her uh, before uh, he was supposed to. She was still married. They adulterated. I mean, the list, you, you know about everything that happened. You know, David did a lot of stuff. So did a lot of us. So don't act like it was all that because you did jump just like I did. All right. So in uh, Psalm 51, verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. So he's acknowledging to the father, these are the reasons that I did what I did. Now remember, remember, David is king of Israel. All the nations are together. There's no northern and southern yet. They're all working together. And David is king of them. And this is a man after God's own heart. Remember, God said that concerning him. This is a man after my own heart. So when we understand that, we look at David as having an advantage back then. And to a certain degree, yes, being a king, but the weight of a king, mm, you don't understand, but you're going to get it because God wants kings and priests. So David had a different weight on him, plus he was a warrior. Remember that? And he had sons who had already cut up. Absalom and everything, you remember? With the whole situation with Tamar, his sister, and, and his, his brother. You know his brother's name, don't you? I just like to quiz you sometimes to see what he had. You know Absalom, you know his sister Tamar. What was his brother's name that he, he wound up killing? You look it up. And so with all that stuff going on, then finally David, with all the things he did, you know, this is a big event because remember, he's adulterating. He, David's got wives, he's got concubines, he's got all this. And even when God came and talked to him through the prophet Nathan, he told him if that was not enough, you could have asked me and I would have given you such and such. So he let him know, if you needed more, let me know. Now watch this. In Psalm 51, 5, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And I was, watch this, and in, my, in sin my mother conceived me. So he's, that word brought forth in the original language is the word shapen. Shapen. So please write the word shapen down. S-H-A-P-E-N. Shapen. So he said, I, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And the word shapen means to reform the mind. Now watch this. To reform the mind. To reform the mind. But watch what it means. It means to hack. To hack. You know how you hack into someone's computer? The word shapen means to hack. Very serious. So David is acknowledging here that something took place in his mind where his mind was hacked. Ooh, there's some good stuff already. I'm telling you, this is good thing, so you can understand. This proves that while he was in the womb being formed, that whatever his initial purpose was was still there and solid. Right? But then he said. Watch, I was brought forth, I was shaping, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, or oh, I was shaping in iniquity, and that word iniquity, please write the word iniquity down, it means unequalness, unequalness, and unfavorable situation. Unequalness, and unfavorable situation. The word iniquity means unequalness and unfavorable situation. It also means injustice. And it also means wickedness. Injustice, wickedness, and the first I gave you was unequalness and unfavorable situation. So watch, this is powerful. So David is acknowledging here that he's telling God, behold, I was shapen, I was reformed, and my mind was hacked in iniquity. So remember, iniquity is the inner parts, the inner parts. And he said, in sin, my mother conceived me. So sin, we know, is the first according to 1 John chapter 4, is breaking God's laws. Now, when you put it together, when you put it together, he said, behold, I was shapen 
I was reformed in the mind and hacked in this unequal and unfavorable situation of injustice and wickedness. And in sin, my mother conceived me. So even though and in sin is the last part, that's the core. He's saying when I was born, I was born into sin. In other words, the environment that I was in, when I was in it, began to hack my mind. Come on, this is some good stuff. It began to hack my mind and it affected my, my conscious and my subconscious. And it began to put things in me in iniquity. Because even though we say we were following things, the environment where I was born, how I was raised, the things that was going around, it was affecting me because I was I was doing it. I was taking it. I was taking it in. I was taking it in. Though I say I wasn't, it was still affecting me because this environment is an environment of sin. It continually, perpetually, you know, he was born at the time. Remember, he said, my father and mother conceived. Look, my mother conceived me. So he's saying, not just that, in sin, my mother conceived me. So was there a covenant? I don't know. Were they married? From what the writer said, no. So this is important. He's acknowledging here. He, remember, David is king of Israel. And he's acknowledging to God, being a king isn't enough. Being in my position isn't enough. In this system that I'm in, the world system, the, remember, this is the age of Satan. This is the age of Satan. Remember now, you've got to understand, David is still in captivity to sin. He is the king of Israel. God has done victories by his hand. You know, David and Goliath and other things and a warrior. But David is still now acknowledging, wait a minute, I'm realizing something here. That even though I have all this going on, it's still affecting me. I need help because he's the king of Israel. He's got soldiers at his beckoning. Anytime he speaks a word, it's a law. He made a law concerning Israel that all Israelites shall share everything together, whether they have it or not. It's called the commonwealth. That's David, and that's a law on the earth, and God has honored it. But I'm saying to you so you can understand this. Later on, the writer writes concerning the people who have wealth. He said, for those that have wealth in the world or that have the world's goods, it says, distribute them to your brother and sister. That's a whole other story because we see that people who have wealth that say that they're supposed to be part of the body don't help people the way they're supposed to. They're too busy hoarding them for themselves. But that's another topic. We'll talk about that another time. So you must understand here David is the king of Israel, he, of all Israel. And he's acknowledging that my mind and my heart has been hacked by this culture, by this society, by this world system. And in it, it put these things... And when I saw this woman, when I saw this woman, wickedness and injustice and all this thing was in me, unequalness and unfavorable situation. Why? Because he's acknowledging the, the it's off. Everything's off tilt. I shouldn't be doing this, but it's in me to do it. I shouldn't want to do it, but I want to do it. Why? Because remember, he was born, he was brought, he was shapen in iniquity. So he, he oh boy, I'm going so fast because I'm so excited. He said, I was brought forth in iniquity and in my mother's <laughs> and sin, my mother conceived me. So he's, he's letting you know that this whole process of once you're born into the world system, their next motive to you is to hack you with everything around them. They're trying to hack your purpose. They're trying to hack you because you're born, you're born in sin, into sin. And the system is set to prepare to oppose everything that has to do because the word oppose is what we get the word oppressor. You see, the oppressor opposes the Most High, the God of Israel. And so he's, they're trying to do everything they can to get you to acclimate to their habits, to their systems, to how they do things over and over and over and over so that you'll accept it as being normal. So when something happens to you, instead of letting the laws of God for your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, guide you, you go in there and you do it because why? Because what's in you? Iniquity. What's iniquity? Hidden sins. Hidden seeds of unrighteousness. And David is acknowledging, I'm a king and I can't make it. No much. He's got guards, like I said. Nobody can do anything to him. He's got protection 24 hours. He's got everything he wants. And he's saying, that's not enough. What's coming, as great as all this is, and, and I got it, it's not enough. Because there's something going on and I need salvation. I need salvation from this system. I need help from what I'm in. I, I'm a king. I can do all that. 
but I can't save myself. This isn't going to work. My own hands can't serve, save me. Though he was a man of war, nothing can rescue David except salvation. He needs salvation because he realizes grasping everything in the world is nothing because eternal life will show up and if salvation is not available for him there is no hope for him that's why the Messiah said what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul David is understanding that as he's writing this and he's saying this stuff was in me because I was born into injustice. It was an unequal situation I was born in, an unfavorable situation. What do you mean? I'm, I'm in a no-win scenario here. And it's affecting me all the time. That's what David is saying. And I need help. See, we're in captivity. But we think being here, because we get houses, land, and all this stuff, that we're okay. No, we need salvation. See, the first aspect of salvation is what Christ did when God gave him for us. The next aspect is what we always skip when we think, well, I, I confess Jesus and stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about that another time. I'm saying to you that the Bible says clearly, the manual, work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling which means the complete total salvation will not be complete until the Messiah comes. It is not that you're not on your way there, but remember, we're still in the testing arena. We're still being tested, and we're still being tempted, and it's not gonna change until Christ comes. You need to understand that. Captivity is a place of temptation, and it's a place of testing. That's what it's gonna do. That's why the Bible says about Christ that he was tempted in the same like manner we are. That's what it says. So let's see how. And so let's go to Psalms 13. And I want you to see how this, how David handled these, some of these things because we're going to have to handle them similar and understand them, I would say. It's already been handled for us because he's talking pre-Christ. We can now talk you know, after. Why? Because I want you to see what he said. Because all the greatness and everything he had, he really didn't look at that at this time, he's looking at, I'm in trouble because there's stuff going on in me and I need salvation. I need to be saved from this present world system that's affecting me. Are we in captivity and have we gone to the place where we're actually doing everything in captivity that we shouldn't be doing? That's how we got here. God prophet prophetically acknowledged that in captivity you will worship gods of stone and of wood. So what is a wooden idol that you worship? Well, it used to be made out of wood. Was money? Is money your God? Do you worship money? Do you do anything to get it? Are you willing to lie, cheat, steal, prostitute, fornicate, adultery, pimp, you know, whatever? What are you willing to do? Compromise, steal money from companies, embezzle? I mean, what are you willing to do to gain money? I don't know, I'm just asking. I'm not saying you're doing anything if money is your God. So let's go, Psalms 13 says this how long O Lord will you forget me forever how long will you hide your face from me how long shall I take counsel in my soul in other words you know sometimes we listen to ourselves too much having sorrow in my heart daily how long will my enemy be exalted over me that's his position remember he said when we talked about the word iniquity it means unequalness an unfavorable situation. David was a king, and he was ruling all of Israel at that time. But remember, he was also, God spoke to him prophetically. And he also had to understand that even though all this was going on, remember, Deuteronomy 28 was before David's reign. David knew about that, and he knew that Israel would go into bondage and be in bondage in certain places. And he wanted to know how long, because he knew no matter what, the enemy was going to have an upper hand over him for a while, and he needed salvation. Watch this. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Verse 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against them, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I have moved. So he's saying, they're laughing at me rejoicing because, you know, it's bothered me, they see it, and I need help. Watch this. But I have trusted in your mercy. 
my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Do you see that? Your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So David is a king of Israel. He's in the highest pinnacle at the earth on the time. In the world system, there's nothing at that time higher than a king. And David is saying, even with that and all the stuff going on, I need salvation. Because he's reading the writings, he's seeing what's going on. He said, I need salvation. So understand, salvation just isn't, again, I'm saying, it's like, it's continual. It's continuous. Now, you have to learn the laws. You have to learn the precepts. You have to practice them. You have to do them. It's not just one day I do it. It's continual, continual, continual. And the day David didn't practice, the Bible says at the time when the kings went to war, David didn't go. And he was up in the upper room and he saw up on the rooftop and he saw Bathsheba taking a shower, cleansing herself, the Bible says, from her impurities, which is her cycle. He saw her, you know the rest. I'm saying to you, that's why you have to put a guard over your heart. That's why you have to stay in the word. That's why you have to speak the word over your life. Because none of us are immune. David was a king and was caught up. We're in captivity. And how much more are they throwing stuff at us, trying to hack us there? Hack, hack, hack. Why? Because that's the term they use for computers. They know what it means. Satan knows what it means. His children know what it means. The, the whole entire system that they're running know what it means, the verbiage and the terms they're using. So watch this. I want you to see how prolific and powerful David is, even with all the writings, and how he's seeking God and how he's beginning to acknowledge some things to God, that how his help is going to come. Now go to Psalms 3, and then we're going to move over to captivity. I want you to see this. Because as you see this, you begin to understand how it works. Because just because you're in a high position in a job, in a corporation, your own business, you're still in captivity. David was a king and he realized I still need help. I still need salvation. You are not getting in the kingdom unless it's through Christ. Bottom line, you're not going to get in there unless you obey the laws of God the best you know how. That's why you learn them so you can practice them. You know in captivity you can't do every single law because you don't know them and you're learning them. But the ones you learn, you need to do because that's how you move forward and that's how you grow. We've been through that plenty of times. I'm going to keep saying it till you get it. So let's go to Psalms uh, 3. Now, I'm just going to go to verse 3 because I don't have time to read all of it. Psalms 3.3. 3. Now this is going to change everything how you see I pray it says but you O Lord are a shield for me my glory and the one who lifts up my head and the original it says for thou O Lord art a shield about me the glory and the lifter of my head now as you've read it for years you've read it and have been people have taught me to have said something to me in the past and they were wrong they didn't know the Bible they read it like he was talking about himself. That's not what he's doing here. He starts off, then he switches. And I want you to see, because when you see this, you're going to understand how it works. This is some good stuff. Let's go back. He says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. A shield. My glory and the lifter, in your Bible it says the one who lifts, in the New King James, it says the one who lifts, but the original one says the lifter. That word lifter, please write the word lifter down. That word lifter is the word promotion. 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 And it said lifts up my head. Now, in reading that and not understanding, you think the word head is his head. Like he's down, he's sad, and he lifts up his head. That's not what it means. Watch, write the word head down. I apologize, right? The word my head or mine, M-I-N-E. Mine or M-Y. In the original, it's my, my head. That word head, my head, please write down the word captain. Also, chiefest man, chiefest man, and then highest priest, highest priest. The word my head means captain, chiefest man, and highest priest. I'll read it again. My head means captain, chiefest man, and highest priest. So watch as we understand this. This is powerful. 
David is saying, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. Got it? My glory and the promotion of my captain, my chiefest man, and the highest priest. He's acknowledging that the Messiah is his head. And when he's talking about lifting or promoting, you remember he, they lifted him up on the cross. He's acknowledging him. Come on, this is some good stuff. He said, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. In other words, what's coming on me, come on, the Messiah is going to take it. He's going to take it upon himself. That's going to shield me from the punishment that was due me. The writer said that he laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You see? So David is saying, the one who's coming is my head. He's my captain. He's my chiefest man. Because he came in the image of man. And he's the highest priest. He's saying he is going to be, you're going to lift him up. Gonna, and what's due me is going to come on him. Woo, glory to God. We got to understand that. That's what David is saying here. He's not saying you won't lift my head up. No, he's saying the only way I'm going to get, the only way salvation is going to come is my head is got to come. That's prophetic of the Messiah. My head is got to come. My head is got to come. Remember, the writer said, we are the church, but Christ is the head. Come on. He's saying, I need the Messiah to come for my salvation. I need the Christ to come for my salvation. I need the Christ to come to remove the iniquity. I need the Christ to come to get me out of this. I need the Christ to come to promote me. Why? Because I'm in an unequal situation. I'm in wickedness. I'm in injustice. It's unequal and it's an unfavorable situation. He's the only one that's going to get me out of this. Come on. That's some good stuff to the the glory of God. This is what he was saying here. He doesn't, it's not about his head. It's about the head coming and shielding him from what God is going to do because the writer said in Isaiah the Lord God, the Lord God has laid on him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. This is what David knew and that's why he went there and said look I know the Messiah is coming. I got all that. And I did this because I was born into sin. And I was shaping in iniquity. I need salvation. The only thing that's going to help me is you, you, got, you have to help me. Because where I'm at is unfavorable. And there's nothing I can do about it without his help. Because it's in me, in my inward parts. And that's why the next line, he said, you desire truth in my inward parts. When he's telling God about his situation. Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father except by me. We need to know that. That in captivity, they're bombarding you constantly to try to get you off your game so that you'll compromise and that you will neglect so great a salvation. It's called cultivating captivity. In the midst of this, we still must obey God. We still must honor his word. We still must live a life before him that is worthy of the calling for which we have been called. For we are the elect of God. Let's go. Daniel, let's look at captivity. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Oh, boy, there's some good stuff today. So in the midst of all the stuff you're going through, understand this too shall pass. We're not going to be here forever. But while we're here, we got to do the word of God. We still have to obey. We can't just sit there. Daniel chapter 2. We talked about chapter 1 before. We talked about the main change of them being in captivity. We're going to go to chapter 2 verse 10. I'm going to start here. There's a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. They're in captivity now. Remember, they're in captivity. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he's asking all the people, his sorcerers, his witches, his warlocks and all that. Remember, Daniel's over all of them. He's over all of them now. And he's talking to them about a dream he had and they can't answer him. So we're going to start in verse 10. Book of Daniel chapter 2 verse 10. It says, The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It, it is a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods who dwelling is not with flesh. So they're acknowledging that if you want an answer to this dream, because he didn't tell them the dream, he said, if you all that, you should know what I dreamt. And they're telling him, all the stuff you're asking us, no other king ever asked us. And the only one I can tell you, it can't be somebody who's on the earth. A 
talked about it before. Remember, the, the world's problems cannot be solved by the world because they're using the same system to create new problems. They call them solutions, but it's not a solution. It is captivity. All right? Now watch. And they're telling him, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So they're telling him, this is above us. That's why Christ said, I'm from above, you're from below. God knows everything. So he's, even through these wicked witchcraft, full of Satan being used people, they have enough basic understanding after seeing, what, after seeing what went on with Daniel and everything. They know that the answer can't come from them or the sources they've used. Got it? Okay. Verse 12, for this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Why? Because the king now numbered them with the wise men. Remember that? And so Daniel, even though he wasn't part of them, he was in captivity and the king was like, ah, oh, you're in captivity. Even though you're in a high, remember, he was in a high, very high position because of the wisdom that God gave him. He was a prophet. And the king was like, look, I'm going to kill you too. I'm going to kill all of them. Now watch verse 14. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, all right, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to the, his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So he went, he told his friends what was going on, you know, the names here are very clear. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their original names. He went and talked to them and said, this is what's going on. The king put out a decree. Everybody that's incorporated as far as he see, wise men, magicians, whatever. If you can't tell him his dream, he wants him killed right now. So the, his, his buddy, Arioch, the king's buddy, started killing him. Got to Daniel. Daniel said, hey, why is it such a hurry? Got a little time. Went home. They talked about it, prayed. God gave him the answer in the night vision. Now, let's go to verse 24. I'm skipping down because from verse 21 to 23, Daniel is honoring the Most High. Verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said to him, thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. So he's, telling, he's asking him to stop the killing, put me before the king, because I have the answer. Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Here is a key. Daniel is in captivity. He's from the tribe of Judah. He's saying here in the manual, I have found a man of the captives of Judah. Now remember, he's in a high position of authority. Very high. Daniel is right next to being governor. He's pretty much governor. He's going to be governor. May, and who will make known to the king the interpretation. And guess what? It doesn't matter. Remember, he still wanted him dead. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshar? Belteshar. Ah, it's a long name. Belteshar. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen in its interpretation? Verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers, these are all witches, cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known the, the king, watch this, he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your head upon your bed were these. And he began to explain to him, you know, it's the statue, and he begins to explain about the gold, the different captivities and time frames, so he got down to the gold and the sand mix, which is where we're at right now, which is the final kingdom. So he's explaining to him. This is very important, because he made a statement here, and I want to go back, because I want you to see. Verse 28, he said, but there is a God in heaven 
Remember earlier, they said nobody with flesh on the earth can settle this. Daniel said, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So he's, a, he's telling him, your dream came from God who is in heaven. And he's letting you know what's going to happen in the last days of this last age. This is very important. Because even though Daniel was captive, he's a prophet, he's Israel, he's a slave, he has limitations, they do things, but remember, he's with all the soothsayers. So in other words, in captivity, he's even though he's Israel, he is still treated like everyone else when the king doesn't get what he wants. So when any opposition or anything happens, the king then treats Daniel along with everybody else in the group because when they number you with the group, you get treated with the group. That's how it works in captivity. When you're in captivity, whatever is happening to that group, they ascribe to you the same thing. So in captivity, all the witches and warlocks, though Daniel was not one, neither his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, yet because the king classified, because the king classified them, he made all of them suffer the same thing because in captivity, classification is very important. So he classified them. In the kingdom, birthright is the key. In captivity is classification. So when they bring you in, they classify you or they put you into a category. Oh boy. And that's what they did. So please write these four things down. I'm not going any further with Daniel today. I got some more to talk about with him, but not right now. I want you to write these four things down about captivity that's pretty interesting. Because as you see this, you'll get it. All right? Number one, captivity does not <laughs> captivity does not cancel your kingdom access. Captivity does not cancel your kingdom access. Even though you are in captivity and they're trying to cultivate you, you still have access to the king. You can still pray to the Father in the name of the Christ. You still have access. So you can't just sit there and say, I'm just going with the punches. I'm just going with the crowd. No, no, no. Captivity does not cancel your kingdom access. Daniel had full access through prayer. Him and his friends, they got together. Sometimes you got to get with people and pray. But understand, this is before the resurrection. So after the resurrection, come on, the veil has been rent. We have total access even in captivity. Number two, God reveals the hidden things to his people in captivity. God reveals the hidden things to his people in captivity. No matter what, when I finish, I'm going to go back and read them again. God reveals the hidden things to his people in captivity. So you think, well, people are having meetings, they're doing things, they, you know, they're making uh, unjust laws and doing stuff and all these things all over, or people are doing this, I don't know, it's a list of stuff that goes on. And he's saying, it's okay, you pray, God will tell you what's going on with them. God reveals the hidden things to his people in captivity. He doesn't want you to be not in the know, because God is always in the know because he's omnipresent. Number three, oppressors do not have wisdom, revelation, vision, or insight from God. Oppressors do not have wisdom, revelation, vision, or insight from God. I'll read that again. Oppressors do not have wisdom, revelation, vision, or insight from God. And finally, number four, oppressors steal your ideas and call them inventions. Oppressors steal your ideas and call them inventions. So let's start at number one again. Captivity does not cancel your kingdom access. Yes, we're in captivity. Remember what God said to Moses, I have heard the cry of my children in Egypt. Captivity does not cancel your kingdom access. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Live right. Follow the laws. Prayer, prayer. Get with your brother. Get with your sister. Get with your husband. Get with your wife. Get with your children. Get with your cousin. Get with your uncle. Get with your aunt. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Bombard heaven with prayer, prayer, prayer. Make God listen. 
prayer. How do you make them keep praying, praying? Can he turn it off? Absolutely. But when he turn it on, he's going to still hear it because it's right there. Prayer, prayer. Oh, you don't understand the law. Prayer is a law. It's a legal right. Pray, pray, pray. Christ said men shall always pray and not faint. Pray, pray. And when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, when should you pray all the time? Prayer, 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 pray God in. Pray, pray, pray. Well, you sound like you just make prayer so important that you have to do it every day. No, you should do it before the day. You should do it at night. You should do it in your car. You should do it while you're walking. You should do it while you're talking. Man, listen, you should do it while you... Listen, if you pick the word of God, the manual, and you read it out loud, that is prophecy, but it's also prayer. See, you don't understand the rules. It's not just sitting there mumbling stuff like Christ said. Don't be like the who? The heathen. Don't be like the religious leaders just mumbling stuff, big words. Thou, O God, who keepeth and thy, who thy word of See, I have time for all that foolishness. Get real with them. Father, I need to talk to you. Forgive my sins. I repent. I cut up today. I didn't do what's right. Oh, Father, I'm purposing to follow you by your truth, by your laws, by your spirit to obey you. For thy word have I hid in my heart. Oh, your word is a delight to me. I, take, I rejoice in your truth. I find salvation in your truth. See, when you understand that, you're saying it, you're praying. It's not just, oh, God, no, no, no. When you say it, that's why Christ said, and when you stand praying, you can walk through the house and just say, you know, Father, I just want to praise you today because you're mighty and you're good. I'm in captivity, but I realize it's just because of what happened. I'm here, I, it's just, but I realize from what is written here, and I trust in you that you're coming to rescue us. I realize that you're going to preserve us. I realize that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord God shall deliver us from the all. I realize that, and I trust in that. I trust in the Lord God with all my heart. I lean not to my own understanding. In all my ways, I'll acknowledge him, and you shall direct my path. Man, when you start saying that, what are you doing? You're praying. You're bombarding heaven. The religious aspect is to put on your tassels, get yourself together, your, all this stuff, and sit around and get all religious. Oh, almighty God. And all that stuff. You got time for all that foolishness? That's religious rhetoric. First of all, you don't mean it. Your heart ain't in it. You're doing it so other people can acknowledge it. Christ dealt with that in a whole chapter almost. And let you know, don't be like them. Don't pray before men with big exuberant words so that they can talk about you and how deep you are. You know, people who deep, and you don't have to hold on now. Most people who think they deep and think it's a revelatory, they don't they don't know how to pray. They pray concerning themselves. See, oh boy, prayer is not about you. It's about bringing God's kingdom to earth. See, the problem is this. That's why when they ask Christ, the disciples ask Christ, teach us to pray. He said, Thy Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. What was he doing? Bring bring the government to earth. Come on, you got to understand what he was saying. Religious people, oh, my anointing, oh, my power. You don't understand how I walk. You don't understand how I talk. Get away from them. They crazy. Those people are sick. Move, run fast, turn it on. Break in some new sneakers, slides or whatever. Get away from them. Why? Because when you start praying about how deep you are, that's your own righteousness. Those people are in trouble. You need to understand prayer is so important that you can afford not to pray. I'll say it slow. And if you're taking notes, write it. Get it on the screen. Everybody that's listening under the sound of my voice, this should be your declaration over your life every day. I can't afford not to pray. Come on, say that with me. I can't afford not to pray. One more time and look up. Father, come on, say it. Father, I can't afford not to pray. Why? Because prayer makes heaven it takes notice because there's a government that's coming that's here and it has to listen because you're praying according to the word and the will of God. He must respond. The writer said the angels hearken to the voice of his word. He can't sit there. It's impossible for him to sit there. Men should always pray and not faint. You should never take a day off from prayer. Why? Because when you pray and when you pray and when you pray and when you pray, Pray, and when you pray, it gets to the point where prayer is such a necessity in your life, you won't even function without it. Let's read them again. Cap number one, captivity does not cancel your kingdom access. Captivity does not cancel your kingdom access. Number two, God reveals the hidden things to his people in captivity. God reveals the hidden things to his people in captivity. Remember, Daniel is in captivity and God is revealing stuff to him. He's not free. Number three, oppressors do not have wisdom, revelation, 
vision or insight from God. So they manufacture lies. Oppressors don't have wisdom. Remember, where's wisdom come from? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. What is revelation? The word revelation means to be revealed, so it means it must belong to God. Revelation. Vision. Vision is what you were given before you got here. Vision comes from who? God. Insight. Insight is actually the laws and precepts of God speaking to you from the inside of out. Insight. In sight. So it's seeing what God sees from the inside out. Oh boy, I, that, some of you can't handle that today. That's what it is. That's why the apostle prayed that God would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Insight in what he wants done on the earth. This is coming from God. Oppressors do not have wisdom, revelation, vision, or insight from God. So they manufacture it through science. That's what science is. Science is their God. It's their witchcraft. It's their way that they control people through science, through uh, medications, through uh, pharmacies, through all the things, technological advances. Remember, Christ said, the thief cometh not except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life. The word kill there means to push forward. So what does pushing forward mean? It means advancement. That's why they, term, they change the terms. They call it what? We're moving forward into technological advances. They're trying to push people forward. Christ said, I come that you may have life. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. So what did Christ bring back? The law. He brought back the commandments because we weren't doing them. So the king, brought the, the king reintroduced the commandments to Israel. Ooh, okay, let's go. Oppressors do not have wisdom, revelation, vision, or insight from God. Boy, I, I got to get off that because I'm going to stay there in the kingdom. And I know if I start talking kingdom right now, the next whatever minutes I have, that's all we're going to go into. And number four, oppressors steal your ideas and call them inventions. Inventions. Remember the word inventions. What's the first word? The prefix in. Then. So it's coming out. So it came from somewhere else besides them because they don't have, a lot of them don't have that. Most, all of them don't have that, but they don't have the inventions. Remember, Adam was sent here, and I showed you this before scripturally, to bring the kingdom of God or the laws and precepts. That's why God gave him the laws. Adam disobeyed God's laws, and he decided to declare independence. The culture that is in place right now, the age, declares independence from God in every aspect. Watch now. So if that's the case, then to rededicate or look for salvation is to move back into the original state. So God did not send Adam to gather what he needed from the resources that were in the world, because remember, there were other people in the world already. Man, this man is who, the mankind, God chose Israel out of the whole conglomerate of everything on the earth to do what he wanted. Remember, I showed you that in the church, all right? So when you understand that, Adam didn't need to depend on anything external because everything was inside. So every invention that has been released in the world, even though the wrong people got it, it, it was supposed to come through the right people. But because of their sin and what they were doing, the other people got it because we kept breaking God's laws, our ancestors. So it's not really theirs. And then they twisted it and contorted it and they made it to, as a, to use against people instead of to help people. That's what happened. You can go see, search the scriptures on that. And that's what God did. He pre-Adam. He set him up so everything he needed would come from him. That's why Christ never depended on an external resource. Because Christ is the model that Adam came from. Remember the Bible says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Okay. So if that's the case, Father, Word, Spirit, Angels. Oh yeah. And so understand that. So if that's the case, Christ never depended on the world system. He depended on the, remember when he was in the wilderness and he was there 40 days and he was hungry and Satan told him to turn the stone into bread then later on in uh, John chapter 4 when the disciples came after he was talking to the woman from Samaria and they told him they said are you hungry he said I have food that you know not of the food is to do the will of my father so he they don't understand that terminology what he was saying he's saying as long as I obey the laws and precepts and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do I'm going to live from the inside out. Oh, boy. Let me move forward. Psalms 14. One more after this, we're going to park. See, our problem is we're living from the outside in. From, cap from That's how they cultivate us in captivity. They have us do things and take shortcuts to get advantages, but they're not advantages. I showed you this before. A shortcut is really the longest way around. 
One more after this. Psalms 14. Uh, this is some good stuff today. I, I just want you to, this is an encouragement to you that even yet we're in captivity, but we still have to do the laws. We have to help each other. We got to work better together. We're not doing the best. We got to do better. And then doing that, we got to stop blaming other people for us missing the mark all the time. We have to take responsibility and say, you know what? We have to do better with each other. All right? Psalms 14. Are you there? Verse 7 says this. Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. That word Zion is another word for Israel. Oh, the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion. Remember, the Messiah came through Israel. When the Lord bring back, watch this, when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. So he's acknowledging here that it is going to happen because remember, David is a king, but he's also talking about needing salvation. He's also talking about the captivity that's coming for Israel, but he said God is going to bring us back. Come on, it's right here. He said, when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Verse 7, oh that, oh, that the salvation of Israel should come out of Zion. That's an exclamation point. He's celebrating. Oh, that the salvation of Israel should come from Israel. That's what he's saying. He's saying, even though we've been cutting up and doing stuff, you would send through us what would help us. When the Lord bring back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. He's saying, come on, come on. Even though we're cutting up, he's going to still send the Messiah through the bloodline of Israel. He's rejoicing in the God of his salvation. Why? Let's go to Revelation 3. We're going to park here today. i got so much more I want to share, but I can't today. And I can't, I won't because of time. And I don't want to get so far ahead. Oh, man, it went so fast. It went so fast today. Revelation 3. I'm going to park here today. We're going to continue on in this series, Cultivating Captivity. I'm going to talk about some other stuff, but I want you to see this. Now, some of you may know this, because I know some of you are very deep. But then some of you who don't know this, uh, Revelation chapter 3. Let's go to verse... Uh, uh, let me see. Let's go to verse 11. Revelation 3.11. We're going to park here. Now, watch this says, Behold, I am coming quickly. You know who that is. You know who that is. All right. The Christ. The Messiah. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast. That means be stable, unmovable. Don't compromise. Hold fast what you have. That no one may take your crown. No one. Because nobody's going to deliver us but the Messiah. Watch this, verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. In other words, you're not going to be cast out no more. Pillar talks about a position of authority. Oh boy. I will write on him the name of of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God watch this and I will write on him my new name there comes a time as a teacher of the gospel when you we call it the mic drop. That's what the world calls it. This ain't the mic drop. This is the universe. Everything is ever made drop. He's saying, you do what you're supposed to do. Not only are you going to be a pillar, not only are you getting in, not only am I going to write names on you concerning my father, but go back to verse 12. I want to read it one more time. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, city of peace, which comes down out of heaven from my God. Watch this. And I will write on him my new name. Oh, it's going to be some name. There's going to be a lot of name changes in that place. 
And here it is, the Messiah saying, I'm going to write on him my new name. Cultivating Captivity Part 2. We're going to have to really focus on the fact that the kingdom is here. And all this stuff, these slave names and all these things that are going on, and I said it before, you got to go back and learn your history. Not what they taught you in school, but way before that. So you can understand who you really are. And what God planned is for you through prophecy and everything. But you also need to rejoice. That there's a new name for everybody that's going into the kingdom. And what about this line? And I will write on him. My new name. Not the new name I'm giving him. My new name. Thank you for joining us today. Had a wonderful message. Go back and listen to it several times. Get it. It's going to help you. Cultivating captivity. Understanding that where we're at, it's okay. We know we're in captivity. But we're still awaiting the continual and the fullness of our salvation. Don't cast away your confidence. For in it, there's a great recompense of reward. He that's begun a good work, you, is able to continue that work into the coming of Jesus Christ. Understand this, we will be rescued. God will have the kingdom on earth and he about now is the mailing, which is P.O. Box 190575, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33319. Protect this word, Father, I pray in their hearts and minds that they will hold true and begin to walk and understand that there's a lot of pressure that comes in this captivity that they're trying to get the word out of us. They're trying to hack us every day. But thank you that your word will prevail and keep us and will lead us into salvation in every aspect of our heart, mind, soul, and spirit. We honor and bless you and thank you, Lord, for our head, our captain, our chiefest, and the highest priest has fulfilled his assignment. And he now makes intercession for us. Let us not cast away our confidence. For in it, there is a great recompense of reward through our King. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Happy Saturday.